Coming up on DTNS, why Russia should not be cut off from the internet, a way for YouTube and Instagram creators to offer on-brand food delivery, and do we want ads in our streaming video? But what if it's free? This is the Daily Tech News for Friday, March 4th, 2022 in Los Angeles. I'm Tom Merritt. And from Studio Redwood, I'm Sarah Lane. From Columbus, Ohio, I'm Rob Dunwood. And I'm the show's producer, Roger Chang. There is a longer version of this show where we discovered Sarah Lane still has a cassette player within reach. Uh, you can get Good Day Internet by becoming a patron at patreon.com slash DTNS. Big thanks to our top patrons. Today they include Brad, Kevin, and Paul Thiessen. Let's start with a few tech things you should know. Samsung announced it will release a software update soon to let users control performance while running game apps. This is in response to the discovery that Samsung's game optimizing service seemed to reduce performance for more than 10,000 apps while not affecting benchmarking apps. No timing on the update was announced. Tech news outlets love to tell you when a deal is struck, but they don't often follow up and tell you when it closes. Good on GeekWire for being among the outlets to make sure folks know that Microsoft has completed its acquisition of voice technology company Nuance. Microsoft plans to use Nuance to combine voice, AI, and cloud for healthcare, retail, telecommunications, and financial services. Sony and Honda sign a memorandum of understanding to form a joint venture to design and sell EVs with the first models planned for 2025. Honda says it will develop the first model handling vehicle design and sales with Sony developing a mobility services platform. The venture hasn't been finalized or named yet, expected to be formed later this year. A group that claimed to have copied a terabyte or so of data from NVIDIA has demanded the company remove the light hash rate, or LHR feature, from the RTX 30 series GPUs, or it will release some of that stolen information. Uh, if you're not aware, LHR limits GPU mining capabilities. So these folks are saying, we want you to let us use G RTX 30 series GPUs for crypto mining. The group previously demanded NVIDIA open source its drivers as well. Have I Been Pwned says it has found credentials for more than 71,000 NVIDIA employees, including hashed passwords in the data dump. The group also claims it has source code and information on unreleased GPUs. All right, let's take a quick look at the many tech stories related to the war in Ukraine. Uh, first up, Microsoft has suspended all new sales of products and services in Russia and is proactively assisting Ukraine to defend itself against cyber attacks. EA announced it will also stop selling its games in Russia and also Belarus. Airbnb suspended all operations in Russia and Belarus. AMD and Intel confirmed that they've stopped shipping chips to Russia and Belarus. Google suspended all ad sales in Russia. Der Spiegel reported that Russia is now blocking access to Twitter, Facebook, the BBC, Duchi Well, and app stores. The BBC has also suspended the work of its journalists in Russia after a new censorship law was passed. And for the first time since 20, 2008, rather, BBC World Service is broadcasting in shortwave in Ukraine and also parts of Russia. Elon Musk tweeted that because Starlink is the only non-Russian communication system working in some parts of Ukraine, the probability of its signal being used to track users is high. Apple has changed its maps to show Crimea as part of Ukraine, except when ac uh, accessed from within Russia, where the law requires maps to show Crimea, Crimea rather, as part of Russia. Id Software co-founder John Romero released a new level for Doom 2 and said he will give 100% of the proceeds to the Red Cross and the UN Central Emergency Response Fund in Ukraine. Russia's Yandex said it will pause its autonomous sidewalk vehicle testing with Grubhub in the U.S. and shut down its robotaxing testing in Ann Arbor, Michigan. Finally, data transport and internet provider Cogent Communications has cut its internet service with Russia clients, saying it did not want to be used or out outbound cyber attacks or dif disinformation either. That is a big one. Cogent is, you know, used to call them backbone transit providers, but they do so much more than that. Uh, there's an argument over whether they're a tier one or not, but they, they are one of the biggest 
ways to get data around the internet. Uh, so cutting off Russia is making it a lot harder for anyone within Russia to access the rest of the internet. Not impossible, but but certainly certainly a big deal. All right, uh, let's switch from that to talking about streaming video, Rob. So yeah, Peacock has a free tier with ads and limited content, a paid tier with ads that has all the content, and a paid tier that costs a little more that gets rid of the ads. Paramount Plus, Hulu, HBO Max, and Discovery Plus all offer a tier with ads that's cheaper than a tier without. Tubi is free with ads for everything, as are Pluto, Zumo, and several others like Samsung TV, which I really love. And now Disney Plus announced that it will launch an ad-supported tier in the U.S. sometime later this year and internationally in 2023. Disney did not say how much it would cost. And from where I sit, this is was inevitable. Um, I believe that uh, Disney Plus came out and was the fall of 2019. So they're, you know, they've been around for a little while. Um, they have been growing like mad. I believe that they they got just under 130 million subscribers as of the end of last year with a 30% increase in Q4. Um, but Disney understands that, okay, in order to continue to grow at this rate, we probably have to have cheaper plans. If you have cheaper plans, we make less. How can we make more? Let's have cheaper plans with ads. So yeah. everyone else is doing it um, regardless of what we feel. Uh, so I think they're now doing it too. I mean, this was this was the whole confusion, at least that I had with Hulu's original model, where it was like, OK, I could pay to not have ads or I could still pay less to have some ads. Um, but I got used to it pretty quick. And I think, uh, you know, all of these, you know, a la carte offerings, they're all trying to figure out, OK, well, if somebody doesn't want to pay seven dollars a month or whatever, you know, that monthly fee is. How can we pepper in ads that, uh, you know, makes people not uh, get, you know, upset and 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 leave, but but they can deal with. Yeah. Uh, the reaction I always see, in fact, the reaction that we got from several of you when I posted on Twitter that we were going to talk about this was I don't pay if there's ads. Uh, it seems like a lot of there are some people who are like, I'm never going to watch anything with ads. Uh I don't think there's as many people who actually do that as there are people who say they do that. Uh, but there's definitely a larger number of people who are like, I'll pay if I, if I can get it ad free or I'll watch it free with ads because it's free. And I understand that I'm, I'm, I'm the product now. Uh, I get it, but paying and also getting ads really rubs people the wrong way. So that said, all of you who are rubbed the wrong way by that, I'm sorry, but you're outnumbered. Because look at the number of platforms who are making a business out of saying it's ten dollars a month without ads, or maybe six ninety nine with ads. There's a lot of people who may, on principle, agree with you, but say, "Yeah, but I really need that extra three bucks." You know, I'll, I'll watch the ads. That's fine. Uh, if if I can still get the content. There's still a lot of people who are just new to uh, you know to getting streaming services. They're coming from cable. You were paying yeah. for cable and you were getting yep. ads. So paying for, well, I'm already getting ads. I might as well go ahead and just pay for this and pay less and still get the ads. You know, it's really not changing anything for me, except I might be paying a little bit less per month. So I get up in arms about this. We all get up in arms about this, but this is what everyone is going to do. They're going to make more money by doing this. So they're going to do this. You know, it, it, it's funny. It, in the last few months, I was at my mom's house and we were watching something on an account that I had logged into. And she was like, where are the commercials? <laughs> and I was like, there aren't any, mom. <laughs> That's the beauty of this. And it was like, wow, cool, you know, high five. But at the same time, I still actually sometimes welcome those changes. You know, like, oh, okay, I have mm, 30 seconds to two minutes maybe to like, you know, use the restroom, microwave my burrito, whatever. So yeah, I think, you know, there <laughs> exactly there <laughs> there are there are kind of like these built-in breaks that a lot of us are used to, even though it's kind of cool to say, oh, we don't have to have them anymore, but we're used to them. Yeah. Yeah, I think so. And I think a lot of people who may have lived a few, you know, cutting edge, they got ahead of the game, used to Netflix, which has no ad tier, right? Everything is paid and it's also more expensive. You know, they could they could offer a lower price tier with ads if they wanted, but they've said they will never do that. Hence, it is more expensive. Uh, I think those people 
come back to ads and it's more shocking than somebody who's coming straight from cable into streaming services and going, oh, okay, so there's a few ads. I'm, I'm used to that. Uh, because usually there's fewer ads in the streaming services than there were on cable. Yeah. Two yeah, minutes, I, 20 seconds that you get on Wheel of Fortune. Yeah, yeah. Oh, oh my gosh. I know, right? Oh, uh, whenever I have Wheel to watch fortune. like a broadcast TV, I'm, I'm stunned. Uh, Feather in your cap, people. Feather yeah. in your cap. The one thing, so so there's the holdouts like Netflix and Stars and a few others that are like still not offering with ads. You either you pay for it or you don't. That's the way we offer it. I have yet to see someone who makes you pay and you get ads and there's that's it. There's no there's no free tier with ads and then pay with like like there's always a pay to get rid of the ads. That is so far been the case. Knock on wood. We'll see. Uh, this is interesting in the standards arena of the web. Apple, Google, Microsoft, and Mozilla are working together on something called Interop 2022, which you can kind of guess from the name means to improve interoperability. They, they are hoping to, quote, improve the experience of developing for the web in 15 key areas. Uh, those areas are all related to how things appear, not necessarily the underpinnings. Uh, so you're talking about cascade layers, color spaces, CSS color functions, new viewport units, scrolling, if you know what those are. Those are all interface appearance elements. And the ultimate aim is to solve compatibility issues across Safari, Chrome, Edge, which is also Chrome, and Firefox. So WebKit, Chrome, and Gecko the three main engines out there. They all follow web standards. It's not like they're not standards compliant, but sometimes those standards have wiggle room for different implementations. Sometimes the standards have gaps, and those can lead to problems in the display. They hope the end result is that web apps will look and work the same no matter which browser you're using. They have some work to do. Interop 22's own test dashboard measures these 15 areas Firefox gets a score of 69 out of 100, Chrome and Edge 61, because they're the same engine, and Safari 50. But experimental and preview releases of these browsers already show improvement into the 70s, so they're making progress. Uh, if you're like, wasn't there something else like that? Uh, there was something last year called the Compat 2021 effort that made some progress on five very specific issues. Uh, but Interop is more wide-reaching, and Compat did not include Apple. So this is uh, a big one because it's got all the major engines on board, as well as software consultants Boku and Igalia. Uh, they are also part of Interop 2022. So the, the idea here is there would be fewer of those situations where you're like, oh, this doesn't work in Firefox, so I have to launch Chrome or vice versa or Safari or whatever. It's been a while since I you know, fussed around with anything CSS um, or otherwise, but is there any takeaway from all the stuff that Apple, Google, Microsoft, and Mozilla are working on that, that we would say, cool, awesome, better browser? I think it's more like cool, awesome. I don't have to think about which browser. Like it, mm -hmm. I, I could just yeah. get this web app to work. It's not like because uh, there's so many things that even you and I, like we're going to be switching to using Streamyard, uh, you know, for streaming, and it doesn't work as well in Firefox as it does in Chrome, or vice versa, depending on someone's thing. I'm not sure if that that seems like it's more of a a non-interface issue. So I don't know if it would be solved by this, but there are a lot of other things that are like, oh yeah, this kind of breaks in Safari. I should probably use Firefox for that, right? We're getting rid of that stuff. Yeah, and I used to do a fair amount, a fair amount of uh, you know front-end web development. And this is like a big thing because you literally, I've got to write this for Edge. I've got to write this for Firefox. I've got to write this for, um, you know, um, you know, for Chrome. So if if we get to where everybody's if everybody's like at 80 <laughs> it's just going to create a lot less work and you may even get better websites you're going to get you know more functionality just because you can develop it once and it works for everybody yeah is, that's the, the is idea. this it's sort of like matter for smart home devices but for browsers i mean it's probably not as you comprehensive could... matter really wants to like make it I, I guess just likening but, it to something where yeah. it's like yeah, everybody yeah. plays nicer with each other. It's it is that it is it is like all the biggies are cooperating. So yeah, yeah, yeah it's a rising tide boats. Everybody's lifted. Well, you've heard of Mozilla and Apple and uh, and Chrome, <laughs> but you may not have heard of Popchu, and you wouldn't be alone. Uh, New York-based Popchu has gathered a list 
of infrastructure and restaurant partnership ingredients so that independent creators can build, also launch, and grow their own local digitally native food brands nationally within weeks. If you're saying, what in the heck does this mean? Allow me to explain. If it sounds like a lot of buzzwords, it is. But creators decide the type of food that they want to sell. So maybe I say mac and cheese. I want mac and cheese, all mac and cheese, but I need all the ingredients to be able to scale this and to sell this to all the people who want to buy my mac and cheese. Popju then looks into restaurants' unused capacity and then helps creators optimize it to create another re revenue stream. All of the orders flow through the company and it splits the proceeds between the creators and the restaurants. So middleman of sorts. Popchu has partnerships with more than 100 restaurants already and growing. Two of Popchu's current brands are Bitcoin Pizza with cryptocurrency enthusiast and investor Anthony Pomp Pampliano. Also one of my favorite names for a restaurant ever, Wing Season, SCN, in partnership with uh, Zias, who is a popular YouTuber available through third-party apps or also the Pop2 website. Co-founder of Pop2, Rushar Parikh, told TechCrunch, quote, we realize that the way that we are eating is evolving. It's turning into content. You see food everywhere on Instagram and TikTok, and we felt the future of food could be creators. However, it's hard for creators to get into food unless there are me mega celebrity working with a food company. Uh, hold on, I just need to pull out my BS machete and uh, I'm gonna do a little, little, little cutting through here. I think there might be an idea inside of all of this somewhere. <laughs> okay. Uh, uh, I yeah. I, I, this one, I, this I one took me a minute as well. Yeah, because there's a lot of like as soon as you say Bitcoin pizza, I saw like half the audience shut their ears off. Uh, but but forget that. Forget you know uh, what, what was is it? Uh, wing season. We are choosing our food or turning our food into content. Um, <laughs> Who doesn't like wing wing season? It's great. Yeah, I love wing season. I'm I'm into that. But imagine uh, what Zazzle did for T-shirts and merchandise. This could do for food. Right. So right now it's very influencer oriented and very buzzword oriented. But what if you as as somebody with maybe a small podcast or a YouTube channel or Instagram following could be like, I always talk about tacos. We talk about tacos all the time on Good Day Internet. What mm -hmm. if we could have DTNS branded tacos? And all we had to do was go to Pop Chew and say, hey, uh, yeah, I, I want to sell merch. tacos and they, they set it up for you. They find the restaurant that makes the tacos and all of that. And then suddenly people can buy through your website, through your social networking account, the food that you're talking about. You know, a lot of this, um, as, as much as I, 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 I'm really into the business model here. I just don't know what the market is beyond novelty. This is an idea. And I'm always up for new ideas. I don't know if this is going to be the thing, though. Um, the, the the thing that immediately jumped to mind for me on this is that not so much prepared food, but maybe more like a HelloFresh type model to where you're able to get excess inventory. You kind of put your logo on it. You're talking about the meals that you would make if you're um, one of these creators that talks about cooking and all that kind of stuff. So you're sending someone a box of food that they can actually prepare for themselves. Seems like that may have a little more, uh, you know, uh, teeth to it, but we'll see. Like I said, it, it, it will be interesting. And I've stopped second guessing what creators can do on the internet because it's like, it's like, <laughs> wow, that's a business. That's yeah. amazing. I, so I, I, I think the 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 prepared food is an interesting spin on this. I I'm, I don't want to discount that, but the uh, or the the box food, the you know the the HelloFresh style, that's interesting. I think that could be part of this too, but I wouldn't discount the idea that like oh I I I follow this woman who talks about uh, her noodles all the time and the noodles she loves, and then she is using Popchu to be like you can get the noodles delivered to me. What's unclear to me is how you do quality control. Roger brought this up uh, when we were talking about it with him. Uh, he, he's like, how do you make sure that this food is good, that it's consistent, that it's you know done by the same restaurant, not 15 different, and everybody gets a different Bitcoin pizza, which I guess could be accurate. You know, and that doesn't like, sound like that's part of this model, at least not right now. You just well, kind of have to I don't know if it is or not. It's really it hard to tell, right? Yeah. You, can't, you can't tell from their website. I think you have to sit down and get pitched by one of them to find out those kind of details. Um, but, but yeah, I, 
I I can't tell if Pop Chu might be 12 seconds. It might be Vine. It might be TikTok. I, you know, it, it, along that line, right? It could be way too early. It might be just a little too early, or it might be the thing. Uh, but I think there's an idea here that if it's not Pop Chu, that somebody's going to be able to make work because we have the confluence of dark kitchens. We have everybody getting used to food delivery. Like those are the pieces that are coming together here. All right, folks, if you would like to order DTNS tacos, let us know in our Discord, <laughs> uh, which you can join by linking to a Patreon account at patreon.com slash DTNS. All right, let's check in on a couple of ways the, the war in Ukraine is affecting the technology world directly. Uh, we're going to check in on the chip shortage and Internet operations. Interesting demands, requests, reactions going on there. We mentioned last week that Russia generates 90 percent of the neon that is used in chip lithography. That's the way you make chips. And that a plant in Odessa, Ukraine, does most of the refining of that, which you have to refining, refine it for it to be used. So about 50 to 60 percent, depending on who you ask, of the world's neon comes out of Ukraine. Ukraine also supplies 40 percent of the gas krypton, make your Superman joke, okay, krypton, which is also used in semiconductor production. There's also a threat to the supply of xenon because of this war. Now, last week, the Semiconductor Industry Association said it was not concerned because the industry has a diverse set of suppliers of key materials and gases. But remember the toilet paper phenomenon. You can have plenty of something and still run out of it if all your customers start to buy more than they usually would because they're afraid it will run out. It's that self-fulfilling prophecy that happened with toilet paper. It happened with chips, and it might be happening to these gases. Ars Technica reports that the president of the trade publication Gas Review, Yoshiki Koizumi, said, quote, the supply of neon, xenon, and krypton is definitely getting tighter because chip makers and trading houses are making more orders in expectation that in the future they won't be able to get as much as they want. There's also a scramble to find other suppliers. Uh, there are many other suppliers around the world. There's a plant in Texas. Uh, there's some in Europe. There's many in China. But switching suppliers sometimes involves compliance uh, that takes you a while and product certification. You want to make sure that new supplier is giving you the stuff that is good as the stuff that you got before, that it's properly refined, that it works. In the meantime, chip makers may face some material shortages, which will reduce yields and lengthen the existing chip shortage issues. And don't expect the reduction of chip sales to Russia to make up the gap. You may be like, wait, but aren't we stopping selling chips? You just said Intel and AMD, right? They confirmed they're not doing that. As we previously mentioned, Russia accounts for about 0.1% of the world's semiconductors per year. A significant portion of those are analog semiconductors used in industrial equipment, things like motor controls. Germany's Infineon has been the largest exporter in dollar amount of chips to Russia but that business makes up less than 0.01% of Infineon's revenue. Still, every little bit of extra capacity is going to help, right? I could not be more surprised that uh, the market share is that low. 0.1% yeah. chips, but Russia? We're Crazy. not talking about the chips that are already in something. We're talking about sending loose chips to Russia to be fabricated into something else. Yeah, even so. Yeah. Yeah, I would have thought it would have been a little more than that. Yeah, it's not a lot. But it's not a lot, so. Now, as we track at the top of each show these days, lots of individual companies and social media and news platforms have decided not to sell or distribute in Russia because of the war. We talked about Cogent even going so far as to just stop providing transit and Internet service to any Russian company. Uh, but there have also been calls to take even more extreme action and remove Russia from the Internet. Ukraine asked ICANN to revoke Russia's top-level domains, including .ru, and asked RIPE, the people who manage IP addresses for Europe, to revoke IP addresses delegated to Russia. Despite the fact that neither organization could just push a button and do that in either case, both organizations declined to even entertain the notion. And the EFF lays out several reasons why these sorts of actions should not be taken. Uh, it sets a bad precedent. If you do it now for one reason, then other reasons become more plausible. It could compromise security and privacy because of how it would alter, alter the existing system. It would change tables and stuff. It would deprive people in the affected country 
the majority of whom have no responsibility for this war from being able to access information. And you may say, yeah, but it's all disinformation, but it's not, it's not all disinformation. In fact, shutting down internet access is what governments often do to control a populace because they're not afraid of the disinformation, they're afraid of the good information that does exist. And it undermines trust in the network. The internet works because of a neutral, multi-stakeholder approach. ICANN, RIPE, and the rest are concerned with making sure bits move securely from place to place, and that's it. Countries can decide if they want to put up a great firewall and all that other stuff. Companies can decide who they want to transit with and who they want to peer with. If you have these neutral organizations cross that line, according to the EFF, and I think this is well said, it undermines the trust upon which the internet is founded. Uh, yeah, uh, um, good points. Um, just to, to, to address one of the points that it sets a bad precedent. I definitely agree with that, but the whole idea of like, well, if you do it for, you know, Russia and Ukraine, then who is to say that you won't do it for, you know, some other conflict in the future. Those conflicts don't exist yet. Those conflicts might, uh, have, a you know, people on both both sides or all sides might have very different views about this. So, yeah, the precedent thing is, I mean, that's something that we think about all the time when it comes to to legal situations. But I'm I, you know, I'm, I'm not sure that this sets a bad precedent. I think uh, laying down the law is is important here. But um, but it, uh, I, I think there are really good points about how existing systems work in the future. I look at this and I say, you know, as a company, as a country, you can determine whether or not you want your bits to cross over into Russia. You, you can actually make that decision. I don't know that the pipes need to be shut down so that you don't even have the opportunity to make that decision for yourself. So I, I get it. But when I just think about, you know, how the internet came to be, why it was designed the way that it was designed to be, you know, it's supposed to be this big giant network that you can't just take down. So if we're now doing that because we don't like what's happening there, I, I do see that as a slippery slope. And I, and I, I want to be careful how I say this. I am not in support of what Russia is doing in Ukraine at all, but there are a lot of people in Russia who will be adversely affected by this. And, you know, it's, it's no fault of theirs. It's, it's their government that is doing these things. But we would really be, you know, you know, squashing, you know, their opportunity to get information, to send out stuff, to receive stuff. So I just don't know that that's necessarily the way to go. There is a role for referees, umpires, line judges that you want to be neutral. It's important to have that. Uh, and that's what I can and right and organizations like them are. And if you ask the referee to start playing for your team, that changes the game quite a bit. Sorry for the sports analogy, but it just seems to be apt. Uh, well, author Brandon Sanderson, who you might not know, has a new record. Pretty cool one. In fact, he can claim the most successful Kickstarter crowdfunded project of all time, surpassing the $20,338,986 milestone previously set by the Pebble Time back oh, in 2015. Oh, wow. I remember that. Huh. Yep, yep, yep. Sanderson's project includes four new novels that he wrote during the pandemic. He didn't tell anybody about them, though. After he announced the project on Tuesday, March 1st, just a few days ago, he broke Kickstarter's funding record by early Friday morning, March 4th. Now, you might say, okay, well, people are interested. Here's how interested they were. Sanderson's original goal was to raise $1 million in 30 days. And the New York Times reports that he hit that number in about 35 minutes. <laughs> wow. <laughs> the campaign has more than 82,000 backers with 27 days yet to raise additional contributions. People want to read these books. Uh, as a host of the Sword and Laser podcast at Book Club, I am not surprised. Brandon Sanderson fans are very loyal, very enthusiastic, uh, and Brandon Sanderson has proved that he can, he can write a novel. In fact, he was the person entrusted to finish the Wheel of Time series when Robert Jordan died before it was finished. Jordan, Jordan dubbed him the successor, and, and he very capably pulled it off. So 
Uh, you know, as much as I loved the Pebble time being the the record holder here, I, I think Brandon Sanderson might be a worthy successor. Yeah, I uh, I I had to look up the Pebble time to be like, what were we all so excited about back in the day? But yeah, just goes to show you, give, give us six to seven years. And all of a sudden, you know, people are like, eh, lots of smart watches out there. How about some books? And I, now I feel like I have to clarify when I pulled out the BS machete earlier, it was not for Brandon Sanderson. <laughs> different B, different S. <laughs> different one. Yeah. Uh, well, listen, thanks to everybody who supports our show. Uh, because of you, we find out about all sorts of stories that make it into the show. Uh, extra special thanks to High Tech Oki. High Tech Oki, you're one of our top lifetime supporters for DTNS. We thank you for all the years of support. Yay! Whoop, whoop. Love an Oki. Love a high tech person. Even more. Even more. Love a high tech Oki. Yeah, beloved, beloved member of the fam. Also beloved is Rob Dunwood. Thanks for being with us today, Rob. Let folks know where they can keep up with everything that you do. It is always a pleasure to be on DTNS. And uh, folks can find out more about me by just looking up at Rob Dunwood on all the things I'm everywhere. And check out my other podcast, smrpodcast.com and The Tech John. That is The Tech, J-A-W-N.com. Well, we are live on this show Monday through Friday, 4.30 p.m. Eastern, 2130 UTC. Find out more at dailytechnewsshow.com slash live and do join us live if you can. We're going to be back Monday to talk about the technology used to research and organize material for a politics podcast with Jennifer Briney. Have a great weekend, everyone. This week's episodes of Daily Tech News Show were created by the following people. Host, producer, and writer, Tom Merritt. Host, producer, and writer, Sarah Lane. Executive producer and booker, Roger Chang. Producer, writer, and host, Rich Straffolino. Video producer and Twitch producer, Joe Coots. Associate producer, Anthony Lamos. Spanish language host, writer, and producer, Dan Campos. News host, writer, and producer, Jen Cutter. Science correspondent, Dr. Nikki Ackermans. Social media producer and moderator, Zoe Detterding. Our mods, Beatmaster, W. Scott is one, BioCal, Captain Gipper, Jack Shin, Steve Guadarrama, Paul Reese, Matthew J. Stevens, and J.D. Galloway. Mod and video hosting by Dan Christensen. Video feed by Sean Way. Music and art provided by Martin Bell, Dan Luters, Mustafa A., Acast, and Len Peralta. Live art performed by Len Peralta. Acast ad support from Trace Gaynor. Patreon support from Dylan Harari. Contributors for this week's shows included Lamar Wilson, Scott Johnson, Chris Ashley, and Rob Dunwood. And thanks to all our patrons who make the show possible. This show is part of the Frog Pants Network. Get more at frogpants.com. Diamond Club hopes you have enjoyed this program. <laughs>